without hurrying, like a man who had nowhere to hurry and who was not burdened by any duties, I went to the house where the political department of the 20th Army was located. I presented a travel order issued by the divisional commissaire Lestive a month and a half ago. The sheet of paper was frayed at the folds, the seal was blurred, the letters could hardly be made out. Polytot de Deltsy were not surprised at this, they understood. They made a corresponding mark on the dispatch note and sent me to the place of my previous service. To the political department of the Western Front, which at that time was located at the station Kaznia, near Vyazma. On the way to the railway station I noticed that the people I met looked at me with suspicion, and even seemed to shun me. No wonder. I looked rather unattractive. My uniform and trousers were faded and worn to such an extent that they did not look like a military uniform at all. In some places the body was showing through the gaps. On his feet, old, once lacquered half boots and shanks from boots, worn like cuffs. It took more than 24 hours to reach Viasma. Five kilometers from the town the train stopped. It was impossible to go fur. Hitler's aviation almost continuously bombed the railway station. The rest of the way passengers made on foot. The city lay in ruins. On streets, corpses of people and horses. Stench of stinking smoke of fires. Every now and then the wounded were carried and escorted away. Among I came to Kassania by a hitchhiker. Hurriedly went to the forest where the front's political department was located. I couldn't wait to meet my friends, to find out about the fate of my wife and children, whom I had left behind in Minsk. At the first dugout, some commander was standing with his back to me, cleaning his boots. I called out to him. No. Comrade, tell me, where is the political department? The man turned around, and I recognized my close friend, senior political officer Boris Mikiev. He and I started our service in a tank brigade, and then worked in the political propaganda department of the district. Our families knew each other well. Boris had not changed. He remained as thin and still spoke slightly through his nose. We had parted only a month and a half ago, and it seemed to me that I had not seen my friend for many years. We hugged each other tightly. Other comrades came up. Raz Gurvarov, Alexiev, Podobed, Rudakov, Muknashev. All of them thought that I had died a long time ago. Do you know anything about my family? I asked. My friends were silent. Boris, trying to shift the conversation to another topic, suggested we go for a snack. We'll have a drink too, he added with feigned cheerfulness. Then we'll talk about everything. I realized that my friends did not want to talk, sparing my feelings. Oh, at least take off your bag, Boris reminded me. Indeed, why am I standing there with a sack? It was as if it had attached itself to me. It was so familiar to feel its familiar weight on my shoulders. Comrades helped me to throw off the straps, and I solemnly handed over to the head of the party accounting department, Battalion Commissar Alexiev, the preserved forms of party tickets and the seal. In the evening I was summoned by the divisional Commissar Estiev. As at our last meeting he was trim, his boots were polished. At his side was a Mauser in a wooden holster. He greeted me with a warm smile. I knew you'd be good at it, said the divisional commissar, said the divisional commissar, shaking my hand, and immediately began to ask questions. What I saw in the rear, what was the mood of the soldiers of the detachment, how the local population treats the enemy, then he asked, wanting to clarify. Hmm. How did it happen that you were surrounded with Kolikovich's division? After all, you were sent to the political propaganda department of the army. I explained everything and referred to General Boldin, who promised to inform the political department of the front about my new assignment. Nothing was reported. Lestave shook his head. I guess he didn't have time for that. He himself was surrounded. I inquired about the situation at the front. It continues to be very tense, said Lestave unhappily. The enemy is rushing towards Moscow. Our task is to wear down his forces on the distant approaches to the capital. It is necessary at all costs to hold Velikonk sky and Gomel protrusions to maintain an overhanging position over the troops of the German Army Group Center. Lestive went to the map unfolded on the table and began to drive on it with the blunt end of a pencil. Strenuous fighting is going on here in the area of Dukovshina and near Yartsev. The main forces of the Ninth Fascist Army are advancing in this direction. Our soldiers are fighting wholeheartedly, but, let's face it, the commanders have little experience, hence miscalculations, mistakes. In addition, the enemy has more tanks, artillery, and especially aviation. 
With a sharp movement, Lestiev threw a pencil on the table and said with conviction, And yet the enemy will not break through to Moscow. We won't let them. Then he sat down against me again. He started talking about my future work. What do you think, if we appoint you to the post of the head of the tank department? Yes, if possible, send it better to the troops, I asked. I would like to work with people. Why do you think that the employees of the political department only deal with paperwork? Lest he have squinted at me. No, of course not, but still... Well, we'll come back to that later. And now you need to tidy up, get your uniform and get some rest. I'll give you orders. I settled down for the night with Boris Mykiv. Before going to bed, he told me everything he knew about my family. The information turned out to be not cheerful. Tanya and her four children stayed in Minsk. I could not sleep throughout the night. I often turned from side to side, striking matches to light a, light a cigarette. Boris grumble. Go to sleep at last. Tomorrow you'll doze off at work. What's my job? I'm still in the reserve. There will be work, don't worry, Boris assured me. And indeed, I immediately began to be loaded with various errands. I was busy all day long, but I felt bad. After the enormous tension of the past month, working here seemed like a holiday, and I couldn't rest. I wanted to appeal to the divisional commissar Lestev with a request to speed up my assignment, but I could not catch him on the spot. It was not without reason that Comrade said that it was easier to meet the chief of the front's political department in a division than in his office or in a dugout equipped for him. Thus a week passed. At last Lestev returned. I saw him as he was getting out of the car. His uniform was burnt out and dusty, but his snow-white collar shaded his tanned neck. The divisional commissar said hello to me and furrowed his wide, dark eye. What are you like dipped in water? Pull yourself up. I had no time to answer the question, much less to talk about my new assignment, as Les Davies had already dived into his dugout. After him hurriedly passed the rear and sanitary department workers. A little later, the head of the awards department was also summoned to him. Hey, the divisional commissar will give them heat now. Hmm, said Georgi Moknachev. Apparently, again, something missed. All those summoned left Lester visibly embarrassed, but by no means offended. I could hear fragments of conversation. We raised the question of sending a disinfection chamber there. Yang military doctor justified himself to his chief, glittering with the glasses of his pince-nez. The regiment does not need our talks, but a camera, the chief argued. The workers of the award department were talking about their own things. Did you write down all the names? I did. I don't understand why there was a delay. It seems that the cases are executed in a timely manner. Now we'll check. In the evening, workers of the political department together with the reserve of political staff gathered in the forest near the station Kaznia. The divisional commissar made a report on the current situation and the tasks of the front political department. Lestive spoke hotly, excitedly. He had no notes in his hands. He gave figures from memory called the names of the heroes of the battles. Is everything clear? Any questions? Asked the speaker in conclusion. There is one question, comrade divisional commissar, rose from his seat unfamiliar to me senior political officer from the reserve. He pulled on his overalls, which hung loosely on his long, bony body, and spoke confusedly. Cance, everything you have told here is understandable. The task is clear to us, but I want to ask how it turns out that the Germans have a lot of planes, tanks and machine guns, and we do not have enough rifles. So you have to fight. And this is coming from a political officer. Lestev interrupted him sharply. The divisional commissar's face flushed red with anger. Yes, it is difficult for us, very difficult. The enemy has a temporary superiority in equipment, but, bravely facing the truth, we must draw the right conclusions. We are stronger than the enemy in morale, and that is a great advantage, and it, by the way, will soon allow us to have everything we need to win. The conversation went on late into the night. And when after it Lestiv went to his dugout, I followed him, not without hesitation. I did not want to disturb his rest, and at the same time I was afraid that in the morning he would leave again and I would have to stay in reserve for God knows how long. I knocked cautiously at the door. McGake, they come in. I heard a familiar calm voice. Lestiv was reading at his desk. He seemed pleased to see him. 
It's good that you came yourself, and I was about to send for you to in. I know you're tired of being in the reserve. Well, you'll go to the tank division, but that's later. Right now we have to fulfill an important task for the military council. Sit down. I can't explain it all in two words. In general, I had to provide accommodation for the wounded in the city of Kaluga. The situation there was acute. The wounded kept arriving and hospitals were already short of places. And here I was on my way to Kaluga. I was flying on a PO-2 aeroplane, and so low that I could clearly see the faces of collective farmers working in the field. Hearing the rumbling of our engine, people look fearfully into the sky, but having made sure that it is a corn plane, they immediately calm down and continue their work. My pilot is young and inexperienced. He drives the car uncertainly, often looks at the map, then he switches off the engine and, turning to me, shout. Hey. According to the time, we should already be over Kaluga, but I can't see the city. We must have lost our way. The plane is planning, slowly descending. The wind is whistling in the metal stretchers. It's strange to fly and not hear the noise of the engine. But then the engine started again. And at that moment, I noticed another aeroplane ahead. It swiftly flew past, turned round with a gain of altitude and went into a dive straight at us. My pilot was finally confused. The U-2 dived down, clinging to the ground, slid over the treetops, and in a few seconds jumped across a small clearing. The pilot jumped out instantly, forgetting even to switch off the engine, and disappeared into the woods. The unknown aircraft flew over the clearing, and I clearly saw red stars on its wings. It was our fighter plane. Out of the bushes appeared the pilot who had fled from me. He embarrassedly wandered to the abandoned machine. It was beginning to get dark. What do we do? Can we take off from this clearing? It is possible to take off, the pilot grumpily muttered. But where are we going to take off? Hell knows where we are now. Then you stay here and I'll go to the nearest village. Find out what kind of terrain. Find out the situation. Just in case, I took my pistol out of its holster, put it behind my belt and started walking towards the forest. In the coming dusk it took me twenty minutes to make my way at random. Stop. There was a path along the edge of the forest. I followed it, thinking that any path would lead to the village. I heard voices ahead. Two girls with sickles came out from behind the bend. Hello, girls. How far is it to the village? I addressed them. Which village do you want? Whichever is closer. The nearest one is two kilometres away. Hmm. What's it called? Well, as usual. Don't be afraid of me, girls, I said, noticing how they looked at each other. Anne of the girls, tall, round-faced, threw her braid behind her back and shrugged her shoulders. We have nothing to fear. But what are you doing here in the forest? I was on a plane to Kaluga. I had to make an emergency landing. We lost our bearings. Help me. Where were you flying from? Merbichan Vyazma. The girls looked at each other again. If you flew from Vyazma to Kaluga, how did you get here? The second one, a skinny, black-haired girl, asked incredulously. I told you that we lost our way. Well, come with us to the village. You will find out everything there. I had to obey. We walked along the path in silence. The conversation didn't go well. Stop. Who's coming? Suddenly a man's voice sounded. I stopped. From behind the trees came ten collective farmers armed with pitchforks and axes. With them a lieutenant with a pistol in his hand and two Red Army men with rifles. The lieutenant approached me. Mo, no. who are you? Show me your papers. Mo, show me yours, then I'll show you mine. The lieutenant took out his ID card and lit a pocket torch. We checked each other's eyes. Are you sure? I asked the lieutenant. Well, your papers are in order. There's nothing to talk about. Let him surrender his weapon demanded some bearded man who called himself the chairman of the collective farm. Let me why surrender the weapon. I was indignant. The lieutenant checked my documents. I am not resisting you. What's the matter? Guys over here. They found the plane, shouted from the forest. But it accompanied by the collective farmers, I headed back to the plane. On the way, we started talking. I recounted the latest newspaper reports about the situation at the fronts. They listened attentively, with interest, but it was still felt that I was still not trusted. The lieutenant and the Red Army soldiers were also wary. We approached the aircraft. The lieutenant carefully checked the pilot's documents. 
Here, as if by bad luck, there was an inaccuracy in the flight list. This made us even more distrustful. Again, there were insistent demands that we surrender our weapons. And one elderly woman said this about, What a son of a bitch! He speaks pure Russian. It was a shame to hear such words, but what to do? They took us for enemies. Having noticed that some aeroplane had landed in the forest, pursued by our fighter, the collective farmers immediately went in search of the pilots and came across us. Soon the secretary of the district party committee, the head of the district NKVD department, and the head of the militia arrived. I was offered to go with them to the district centre. They sorted it out only by six o'clock in the morning, after they called the front headquarters. Then I was taken by car to the plane. They allocated collective farmers who helped us to clear the takeoff area. At eight o'clock we took to the air. It was only thirty kilometres to Kaluga from the place of our forced landing. Immediately from the aerodrome I went to the head of the garrison, then to the city party committee, travelled to hospitals, in short, plunged headlong into work. The wounded arrived daily, in large groups. They had to be accommodated in schools, cinemas, in institutions. And still there were not enough places. The city residents who took the wounded to their homes helped. Once two women came to me. We, comrade commander, we see that the wounded are not well in the large wards. It is cramped there, and there is no real care. Our home is not very spacious either, but we can look after the soldiers. One of the women brushed away a tear with the end of her handkerchief and added, Yes, I myself have two sons at the front. My youngest daughter will look after the wounded, and when I come home from work, I will wash, cook, and whatever is necessary. So you'll let me... There are many such cases. Pioneers also helped us. They patronised hospitals, took care of the wounded, carried out errands of doctors and nurses. I worked in Kaluga for about a week. Returning from a business trip, I reported to Listev on the completion of the task. Good, he said. Tomorrow you will go to a new place of service. You are appointed head of the political department of the 18th Tank Division. Listev looked tired. His eyes were red from lack of sleep. He had just arrived from the compounds and, I was told, was going back to the troops. We always marvelled at him. He was sensitive and attentive to people and completely ruthless to himself. I remember the chief of the political department of one of the armies came to him with a report. Lestiev saw that the man was completely exhausted and ordered him to go to rest immediately, and ordered that a bath was prepared for him and a separate room was given to him. That's how he took care of people. He forgot about himself. In the evening I went round all my friends and acquaintances, said goodbye, wished them success. Boris McKeeve promised to write if he knew anything about the fate of my family. The headquarters of the division to which I was assigned was in the forest not far from the railway station Vadino, ten kilometres east of Yartsev. I would probably have wandered through the forest for a long time if I had not been met and escorted to the headquarters. The division commander, Major General of Tank Troops, Remizov, stood near the headquarters car, camouflaged with freshly cut branches, and talked about something with a group of commanders. Having straightened the folds on my uniform, I approached and put my hand to my cap. Mo, comrade general, I present myself on the occasion of my appointment to the post of chief of the political department of the 18th Tank Division, Battalion Commissar Kochetkov. Well, Battalion Commissar, let's get acquainted. The general gave me his hand. I know about your appointment, but the political department of the front was a little mistake. The 18th Panzer Division no longer exists. We received an order to switch to brigade staff, so you'll have to work as chief of the political department of the 127th Tank Brigade. I hope you don't mind? No, of course not. Comrade General. A pieter Alex Avish called out the general to the commander in the leather coat. Come here and receive the new chief of the political department. The regimental commissar Piotr Alex Solovyovich Solovyov was the commissar of the division, or rather now of the brigade. He took me to the dugout where the political department workers were accommodated. The dugout was homely and spacious, with a rather large window, sealed with oiled paper. However, the paper was torn, and the golden trunks of pine trees could be seen through the window. Get acquainted, make yourself comfortable, and in the evening come to me, we'll have a chat. Mazovyov said and left, leaving me with my new subordinates. 
I in turn introduced myself to the instructors of the political department Lebedev, Savliev, Emelyov, Antropov, and the assistant to the head of the political department to work among Komsomol members Sharendo, whom, as I noticed, with affectionate goodwill called simply Grisha. Sharendo had managed to distinguish himself in the battles. On his chest he had the Order of the Red Banner. We talked for an hour, and then I decided to go to one of the units of the brigade. Grisha Sharendo volunteered to accompany me. We went to the 35th Tank Regiment, which stood not far from the headquarters. I got acquainted with the regiment commander Major Kropsky, Battalion Commissar Sheptov, and Chief of Staff Captain Kashtiev. Even on the way to the regiment, Grisha Sharendo told me that the Battalion Commissar Sheptov enjoys great authority. Hey man, he is quiet, not noisy, but persistent and very brave, said Sharendo. He likes to be in the tank during the battle and fights well, hence the authority. Talking with the regiment commander, I was convinced of the fairness of the characterization given by Grisha. Major Krupski treated the military commissar with respect, often consulted with him. I also liked the commissar of the 1st Tank Battalion Military Technician of the 1st Rank Fyodor Sergeyevich Pobedinsky. He is a newcomer to political work. He was nominated from the post of assistant company commander for technical part, and we were not mistaken. Obedinsky more than ten years in the party, before the army worked as a loader. He easily got along with people, understood their moods, knew their needs. Lurking as a pompatique for a long time, Pobedinsky deeply mastered tank equipment, learnt to drive a fighting vehicle perfectly. In his new position, his technical knowledge came in very handy. Soldiers and commanders, seeing him as a real tanker, gained even more respect for him. With Shepatov and Padinsky, we talked for quite a long time. Unnoticeably, evening came. It was time to go to the brigade commissar. Solovyov was sitting in his dugout and writing something quickly. When he saw me, he nodded his head and invited me to sit down. Just a minute. I'll finish, he said, and bent over the papers again. At last, the regimental commissar laid aside his pen, rubbed his shaven head with the palm of his hand, and frankly confessed. I don't like writing, but what can you do? You have to do it. The commissioner's eyes were cheerful, though he was not smiling. I thought that Solovyov must be a warm-hearted, sociable man, with whom it must be pleasant to work. We have you met? The regimental commissar asked. I replied that I had time to talk to several political workers, mainly of the 35th Tank Regiment. What was your impression? Solovyev asked. The impression is good. In my opinion, they are mostly experienced comrades who know and love their job. The impression is correct. Our division fought in Finland and now it has been fighting for two months. We have people who have been shot at with combat experience. Did they tell you in the front political department about the situation in our section? No. Oh. Divisional Commissar Lesti have acquainted me with the situation but briefly and in general terms. In that case, I'll tell you more about it. From Solovyov's explanations, I learnt that our brigade, part of the 16th Army of the Western Front, together with the rifle formations, had been fighting unsuccessful offensive battles in the Yartsev area for ten days already. The battles were quieting down, then flared up with renewed vigour. The neighbouring 30th and 19th Armies also tried to advance in the general direction to Dukovshina, but they did not succeed. The enemy had more artillery, tanks and aircraft. Due to organisational measures, the brigade was withdrawn from fighting, but some of its tanks were used on the front line as stationary firing points because the rifle formations temporarily went on the defensive. The front line was west of the Velpitz River, a right tributary of the D.I. Pier. I, of course, am a small man and may be wrong, but it seems to me that our offensive will not reach its goal. The regimental commissar finished bitterly. In all likelihood, in the coming days, we will begin to engage in strengthening the defence. In short, the situation is not too cheerful. The Frontiov's assumption was justified. The front on our section stabilised. Infantrymen intensively engaged in the construction of defences. The fascists behaved quite calmly, but they started active agitation. They began to throw into the location of our units a large number of leaflets, passes for voluntary surrender, newspapers and magazines. At night, through powerful loudspeakers, Hitlerites transmitted all kinds of nonsense, up to appeals of Soviet fighters and commanders who allegedly defected to their sides.
the content of leaflets and appeals was very primitive. The power of Nazi Germany was extolled at every turn. The happy life which Hitlerites were bringing to the Russian people was praised. It was striking how cleverly all these propaganda materials were concocted. Hitlerites arrogantly considered the Soviet man devoid of dignity. They spoke to us like a master to an employee, promising to feed and clothe the US if we would obediently work for them, threatening to destroy us in case of disobedience. Grisha Cherendo took advantage of the lull. With the help of Komsomol members, he made a large plywood shield. On it, they drew a caricature of Hitler, and for several days the Komsomol members harassed the fascists. Every morning the caricature appeared here and there in front of the German trenches. At first, the fascists did not shoot at the shield. They wanted to take it down. But after four or five enemy soldiers, who tried to get close to the caricature, were killed by our snipers. The reverent feeling for the sacred person of the Führer, it must be assumed, weakened. The Nazis opened fire and smashed the shield to pieces. Our tankers often carried out daring reconnaissance by combat, broke into the enemy's location. We entrusted them to scatter leaflets and appeals to German soldiers in German language, sent by political department of the front on the territory occupied by the enemy. Letters of Hitler's prisoners to their colleagues were also distributed in the form of leaflets. The prisoners reported that they were alive, they were treated well, nobody was going to kill them, and that after the war they expected to return to their homeland. The comparatively quiet life ended on the first day of autumn. On the night of 1 September, the troops of the 16th Army forced the Vop River, and in the morning went on the offensive near Yartsev. During two days of fighting they managed to advance a little. Then strong enemy counterattacks began, and we stopped. However, the commander of the army, Lieutenant General K.K. Rokossovsky, did not expect to break through the Hitlerite defense. The purpose of the operation was to force the enemy to pull back forces from under Yelnya and inflict possibly heavy losses to his reserves. The army fulfilled its task. For eight days of fights, the enemy lost more than 10,000 killed and wounded, more than 200 guns and mortars. Hitlerites transferred several divisions to our section of the front. Our brigade, which was at first in the reserve of the commander, was put into action on the 2nd of September, when the counter-attacking enemy created a threat to the right flank of the army. We managed to repulse the enemy and capture quite large trophies. After that, the tanks positioned themselves in the forest near the village of Novoselsyi, and the motorized rifle battalion took up defense to the north and northwest of the village. By 10 September, the fighting had ceased. In the middle of the month, the brigade received replenishment. Among some of the Red Army soldiers who had not yet been in combat, we detected unhealthy moods. Some of the young fighters were inclined to overestimate the enemy's strength, believed that his equipment and weapons are better than ours. It was necessary to break such views to strengthen people's faith in their own strength. We held a meeting of political workers of the brigade. It was expressed a lot of interesting suggestions, in particular, the military commissar of the tank regiment battalion, Commissar Shipitov, gave a good idea. Let's organize an exhibition of our unfascist equipment, he suggested. Let the soldiers themselves will be convinced that our equipment is better than Hitler's, that the devil is not so terrible as they make it out to be. Peter Alexeyevich Solovyov, and I went to General Remizov and reported to him about Shepitov's proposal. It's a good idea, the general approved it. Just think it over properly, so that it would turn out clearly and convincingly. Consult with my technical assistant, Karshevnikov. Ivan Mitrofanovich Karshevnikov, having learnt about our plans, was on fire. Why? It's a great idea. He immediately called the commander of the tank repair unit, Major Fedorov, and ordered him to pull out of the battlefield several German tanks that had been hit. Fedorov thought for a while, scratching behind his ear and surprised. As soon as it gets dark, we will do it easily. Zik, zik, and ready? Karchevnikov laugh. You can't do without your fable. By the way, Ivan Mitrofanovich, Mepidorov smiled embarrassedly, who for his fondness for this saying in the circle of commanders was nicknamed Zikolshik. Fedorov did not fail. By morning his repairmen brought to the rear of the brigade four Nazi tanks, six machine guns, two anti-tank guns, brought sirens and howling mines, which often caused panic in the untrained fighters. Next to Hitler's equipment, we put our mighty KV and T-34, our guns and machine guns. Commanders brought here young fighters, told the basic tactical and technical data of our and enemy weapons. 
The comparison was clearly in our favour, for clarity and persuasiveness were shooting at the vulnerable points of fascist tanks. The exhibition made a great impression on the young fighters and fully justified itself. We decided to familiarise all the personnel of the brigade with it. Our neighbours heard about our exhibition. The head of the political department of a neighbouring rifle division came to see me. Well, help us to organise something similar, he said. It is important for us that the soldiers overcome tank fear, learn to fight enemy tanks and cooperate with their own. Understandably, we did not refuse help. Several T-34 tanks were sent to the rear of the rifle division. The infantrymen learned to take cover behind their armour during an attack, to move forward without breaking away from the tanks. Then we showed how a tank troop operates. In conclusion, the tanks toured the trenches where the gunners were sitting. In an effort to convince the soldiers that for a brave, skillful warrior, the enemy tank is not terrible. We demonstrated to the gunners the actions of tank fighters. One of the fascist tanks was placed 20 metres from the trench, where there were Red Army soldiers armed with bottles of flammable liquid. Right on the trench, let the 30 checker. As soon as it, clanking caterpillars, fell over the bumper and equaled the trophy tank, the soldiers got up and began to throw bottles into the fascist machine. The combustible mixture spread on the armour, penetrated through the louvers into the engine group. The tank was enveloped in clouds of black smoke and went up in flames. Hey, so much for half a litre. The soldiers said afterwards, looking respectfully at the bottles, which they had recently treated with distrust. But quick footsteps tapped on the wooden steps of our political department dugout. The brigade commissar entered. Three brand new 30 checkers with crews have arrived. The guys are all well matched, young man to young man. This is not a pound of sultanas for you, brother. Why? Soroviev took off his cap, sat down on the bed, and wiping his sweating bold spot with a handkerchief, began to talk animated. Patient, I was travelling from the second echelon on the motorway. I saw three thirty checkers standing on the edge of the forest. I ask, who's tank? We are from the unloading station. We were led by a senior lieutenant. He went to look for the unit, and we were ordered to wait for him here. So we are sunbathing for the second day. We've already eaten all the Enza. I reasoned that, except for us, there were no tank units nearby. It means that we were sent to us a replenishment. I commanded the crews, to the vehicles, start them up. In short, I brought them here. Hey, but, Pyotr Alexeyevich, these tanks were probably not meant for us, I said cautiously. What do you mean, not for us? They have been standing next to us for the second day. Definitely they were sent to us? No. So why can't the senior lieutenant find us until now? Soloviev looked at me puzzled. Hmmed. Apparently such a thought had not occurred to him. Damn it. Maybe you're right. Let's go to the brigade commander. We'll sort it out there. But we didn't have time to sort it out. We caught the commander and commissar of a neighbouring rifle division at Rimazov's observation post. They asked to rescue a group of fighters which was cut off by the enemy at night. We should help our neighbours, Commissar, said the Commander Solovyov. But with what? Our tanks are on the front line. There are only four BT left in the rear. Let's use the replenishment, suggested the regimental Commissar and told about the vehicles he had brought. Right, let's test the crews. If they don't show themselves well in the battle, we'll replace them with our own veterans and transfer newcomers to BTTs, supported Remizov. We clarified the order of interaction with the rifle units, outlined the deployment boundary, the time of the operation and went to the new 30 checkers to set the crews a task. To approach the woods, where the tanks were standing, as a lorry pulled up. A tall, dense captain jumped out of the back, approached the general and clearly reported. Hmm. Captain Procyon arrived from the hospital for further service. The general happily, not at all in the usual way, hugged the captain's broad shoulders. He's alive and well. Here golly golly quickly healed. Well, well done. Look, Commissar, what youth means. You and I would have had to lie down for a long time after such a wound, and here he is on his feet. Are you really quite well, or are you pretending to be? Rimazov turned to the newcomer again. Hey, I can show you my documents, Comrade General. Quite healthy. Proshin replied with a brilliant white tooth smile. On the captain's chest I saw the gold star of the hero of the Soviet Union, two orders of Lenin and the Order of the Red Banner. This was a well-known in the brigade tank battalion commander Ivan Ivanovich Proshin.
Well, good. Have a rest for now? Hmm. The general said to Prussian. We'll meet you later. Now I'll give these eagles a task. Prussian became wary. Uh, are those tanks not from my battalion? He asked. Of course, from yours. They just arrived yesterday. In that case, allow me to take part in the battle, comrade general. Remizov frowned. No, don't ask. I won't let you in anyway. Get some rest from the road. But, comrade general, it is my duty to test the new crews by fire. Prochian stood his ground. He persistently argued to Remizov that he must definitely take part in the battle. The general finally conceded with apparent reluctance. All right, fidgety, he said with a sigh. Have it your way. I didn't want to send you today, but if you ask me to, go ahead. But don't get too excited, don't get too excited, so you don't end up in the hospital again. I can't count the holes in your body as it is. The general will familiarize Prussian with the situation, gave him a task. We shook hands with the captain, wished him good luck. Prussian went to the dugout to his fellow soldiers, left there a duffel bag and overcoat, changed into overalls, pulled a tank helmet on his head, easily and habitually climbing up on the armour of one of the thirty kevroks. He hid inside the vehicle, then stuck out to his waist from the commander's hatch, raised his hand with a flag. The engines of seven tanks, three T-34s and four BTS, roared. Undermining the bushes, the fighting vehicles began to stretch out on the forest road, which led to the front line. After a while, we heard the rumbling shots of tank guns and the crackle of machine gun bursts. In the dugout of the commander's dugout, the buzzer of the field telephone beeped. Remizov hastily picked up the receiver, listened, and his face cleared up. Everything is all right, hmm, he told us. Prochian swung over the front edge. At about two hours past, the tanks still did not return. We began to worry. The general, frowning, walked from corner to corner worried about his favourite, finally on the left flank heard shooting and the noise of tank engines. The buzzer beeped again. Remizov was informed that all seven tanks were returning. On them, fighters of the rifle unit who were surrounded. We hurried towards the vehicles. General Remizov was rubbing his hands with pleasure. The tankers had fulfilled the task brilliantly. So his forest was filled with rumbling. Here the head tank appeared from behind the bend of the road, and then our joyful excitement disappear. On its armour, carefully supported by soldiers, Prozhin was half lying with a bloody face. As soon as the tank stopped, the general approached him. With difficulty unclenching his singed lips, trying to smile, Prozhin sighed. My fault, comrade general. I got caught in the shrapnel. I forgot that today was the thirteenth day. An unlucky day. But the newcomers acted well. You can rely on them immediately bandage them and get to the hospital. Remizov ordered and, without addressing anyone, said with a heart, he should have got involved in this case. We've lost a fine commander again. Why only I gave in to his entreaties. The tankers said that Captain Prochin was wounded when he was retreating from the hatch to see if any of the vehicles had fallen behind and if all the men were on the tanks. This was the fourth or fifth wound of Captain Prochin. Today to draw up a submission for him to be awarded the Order of the Red Banner, ordered the Chief of Staff. In the evening, Peter Alexeevich told me about Captain Prochin. The brave tanker received the high rank of hero of the Soviet Union in 1940 during the war with the White Finns. Prochin commanded a tank platoon at that time, the penultimate time he was wounded, when he made a daring two-day raid through the enemy rear, scouting enemy defences. The tankers collected very valuable information, but when leaving the rear, the tank got stuck in some ravine. The fascists opened fire on the tank, but the shells did not penetrate the armour, only left dents on it. Only one subcaliber shell penetrated the side of the machine. That's when Prushing was wounded. The whole day the crew fought off the invading enemy, and by evening they ran out of ammunition. Prochin decided to get out of the tank at nightfall, set it on fire and break through to their own, using the last few grenades. But it turned out differently. Seeing that the Soviet tankers were no longer firing, the Nazis at night brought up a tractor and took the KV in tow. Prochin ordered not to disturb fascists. The crew lurked in the car. But as soon as the tractor pulled the tank out of the ravine, the mechanic driver switched on the engine. The mighty KV rushed broke the towing chain and crossed the front line in front of the astonished Germans. In the airing of the tank, there was a piece of chain. 
then the wound was trifling. This time Proshin stayed in hospital for several months. I managed to meet him again only at the end of the war. By the way, the tanks that the brigade commissar brought, it turns out, were sent not to us, but to the disposal of the army headquarters. A member of the military council, Divisional Commissar Lobachev, gave Peter Alexievich a strong reprimand for his unauthorized actions. At the same time, General Remizov received from the commander Lieutenant General Rokossovsky a commendation for the rescue of neighbors. The commander joked about it. Well, so it is so. You, Commissar A.D., for your behavior and I.A.A., add it up and divide it in half. On average, our brigade gets a C+. Plus. Nothing, we can live. When the front was quiet again, General K.K. Rokosovsky came to the brigade to present government awards to those who had distinguished themselves in the battles for Seno, southwest of Vitebsk. I did not take part in these battles. They took place in July, even before my arrival in the brigade, but Pyotr Alexeyevich Solovyov and Grisha Sharendo told me about At Seno, our tankers struck the first sensitive blow to the advancing armoured hordes of Guderian in particular two regiments of his 17th Panzer Division. Early in the morning, the advanced units met the enemy in five-six kilometers from Senno, which the Hitlerites had occupied the day before without a shot. The fight lasted all day, in spite of the fact that the fascists called the Air Force. Our tankers managed to knock the enemy out of the forest near Senno by the evening, and at night to occupy the place itself. The battles were very fierce. There was a moment when tanks and motorcyclists of the enemy broke through to the CP of our connection. The artillery regiment, whose firing positions were located in the neighborhood, helped us out. Artillerymen opened fire on the enemy and repulsed the attack of fascists. The commander was going to give awards to those who had distinguished themselves in the July battles. Called from the front line all the awardees and, in addition, representatives from each unit. People gathered in the forest, built under the trees so as not to attract the attention of enemy aircraft. A folding table covered with a komacha tablecloth was placed in front of the formation. On the table, neat rows of boxes. They brought out the battle flag of the brigade. The formation froze. We could hear only the rustling of fallen leaves under the feet of the flag bearer and assistants, who walked along the line to the right flank. What an exciting event. The display of the banner, Involuntarily you pull up and freeze in the formation, feeling a special spiritual uplift. Faces of soldiers and commanders are stern and solemn. People have recently come out of battle. Tomorrow, maybe, they will again go to meet the deadly danger. And the scarlet cloth, heavy folds falling from the tree, inspires them to new feats in the name of the motherland. It's quiet in the forest. Trees do not move, as if they stand in formation with the soldiers. General Rokossovsky begins to hand out awards. One by one, the soldiers, commanders, political workers, who were awarded orders and medals for courage in battles, for exemplary performance of the command's tasks, approached the commander. After the awarding was over, there was a concert. The political department of the army sent us a concert brigade of Moscow artists. In the depth of the forest, four trucks with folded sides made an improvised stage. I could not finish the concert. I was called to the telephone. They called from the political department of the army and informed me that the chief allowed me to leave for three days to Moscow. This pleased me very much. I had long asked for a short leave, expecting to learn something about my family. Soldiers' training camp was not long. In a few hours I was already in the capital. I came to my sister Tosa. She and her husband Alexei did not expect my sudden appearance. There was no end to the conversations. Unfortunately, Tosaya could not tell me anything new about the fate of my family taking advantage of the opportunity. I stopped by the front's political department in Perkushkovo. Here life went on as usual. In the information department, Georgi Moknachev and Vasya Rudikovs had stacks of reports. Summaries, memos, which came from the units and formations of the front in a continuous flow. On the basis of these documents, it was necessary to draw up generalized summaries and reports on a daily basis. The work is huge and labor-intensive. We are overloaded with papers. There's no time to breathe, Rudikov complained. The information department of the front political department was a kind of headquarters for correspondents of various newspapers and magazines. They constantly came here to find out the latest frontline news, saying that day Mokhnashev was besieged by three journalists at once. He waved them away. No time, comrades, no time. You see how much work there is. 
let's postpone the conversation until the evening. But it was not so easy to get rid of the journalists. Then Moknachev found a way. Mo seen talk to Battalion Commissar Koshetkov, head of the political department of the tank brigade. He has just arrived from his compound. One of the journalists, a senior political officer by rank, came up to me. He was not young. His short cropped grey hair stuck out on his head in a stiff hedgehog. On his thin, hunched nose he wore glasses with convex panes. The look from under the glasses was intelligent and good-natured. The journalist identified himself and somehow immediately engaged me in conversation. I told him about the recent battle in which Captain Proshin participated, about how the award ceremony was held, listed the names of the most distinguished fighters and commanders. The journalist listened, making notes in his notebook from time to time. Now you probably have enough material for two basements, I joked, having finished my story. The journalist shook his head. No, everything you told me I wrote down for myself, just in case. It might come in handy. It's hard to write about a person from hearsay. Proshin, for instance, I'll try to find him at the hospital. I've heard something about him. You'd better come to our brigade and talk to the men. I see the correspondents are talking to Moknachev and Rudikov. You are mistaken, Comrade Kochetkov, you objected the journalist. We only receive addresses in the political department where it is better to go, where there was an interesting event, and we work mainly in the units. I haven't met a single Moscow correspondent in our brigade. That's very possible. There are not so many of us, and there are a lot of units and formations on the Western Front alone. By the way, have you written to the newspaper yourself? I don't have time to do it. That, let's say, is a common and unconvincing excuse said the journalist, twirling his pencil in his long, dry fingers. You find time to prepare, say, for a report. Two hundred, a hundred or even less people are listening to you. If you write to a newspaper, your audience will number in the tens of thousands. And then, to write to the newspaper about a distinguished fighter or commander means to encourage a man. I know all this. I'm sure you do. But you don't write. And tell me, did you talk to your political officers, to communists? simply to fighters and commanders about keeping in touch with the editorial offices of newspapers. I was forced to confess that I'd missed this question. In short, so far, you only half used the opportunity of the newspapers. That's it, comrade chief of the political department? Yes, summed up the journalist. We left the house. Not far from the porch, several political officers, unfamiliar to me, surrounded a short political officer with a full-cheeked blush. He was talking animatedly about something. Those who listened to him were rolling with laughter. Do you know who they are? From the reserve of the political staff or what? I asked the journalist. These are my colleagues, newspaper men. That one, the political officer, returned from a business trip this morning, travelled to one of the divisions. Now he is probably sharing his impressions with his fellow writers. If you like, let's go and listen. He tells interesting stories better than he writes. The politruk looked back at us, nodded to my interlocutor and went on with his stall. The politruk quite similarly imitated the whistle of a flying mine and promptly squatted down on his knees, his eyes darting fearfully. The listeners laughed. I see a German tank hit ahead, the correspondent continued. I went to it. I decided to hide under the tank. I see four legs sticking out from under the bottom. There was another mine. I didn't think about whose legs and why they were sticking out. It turned out that two commanders were also hiding here, waiting out the raid. I asked them, where is the second battalion's key P? And one of them, a captain, with all seriousness answers. At the moment, how so? Very simple, says the captain. I am the battalion commander and this is the chief of staff. So why are you lying here? We're waiting out the rain. We lay there for about ten minutes and then we started running to the heights. By God, I've never run like that before. It's funny, said the political officer, when the laughter caused by his last words died down. But one thing is bad. Because of the fire raids along the gully, hot food is delivered to the soldiers once a day. The enemy can see the gully like on the palm of his hand. The commander complains. The kitchen was broken. Two men who were carrying thermoses were wounded. Can't we dig out the message passage at night? The gully is only 150 metres, not more. Or put some Christmas trees so that the enemy couldn't watch, and the commander only waves his hands. Nothing, they say, somehow, somehow. In my opinion, this is a decent outrage. 
That's what I told the regiment, Commissar. Have you seen your heroes? Asked someone from the audience. What the hell? One of them is already in hospital. The other has gone on a reconnaissance mission, and it is not known when he will return. I didn't manage to talk to them. It's a pity. They're wonderful guys. Here is a typical case from the practice of a correspondent's work in the troops, my new acquaintance said. And you say that we newspapermen only hang around in the political department? The journalist smoked a cigarette, deftly rolling a neat cigarette roll with his slender fingers. We'll keep in touch. We are doing a common cause, he said. And now excuse me, I'll leave you. I'm going to torment Mokhnashev again. He promised me to find some curious document. I met with the inspector of the political department, senior battalion commissar Dubrov. He had just been to Lestiv, who instructed the employees of the political department, leaving for the troops. Volodya Dubrov said that the Nazis are preparing in the coming days to launch a general offensive on Moscow, so there will be heavy fighting. Senior battalion commissar Gorbachev. Dubrov and several other political workers went to the task force of Lieutenant General Boldin, which held the defence west of Vyazma, to the right of our brigade. Many other workers of the political department were also travelling to the troops. It was no longer possible to stay in Perkhushkovo. Big events were coming up. I once again visited my sister, took her photos of my wife and children. Memories came flooding back. To distract myself from sad thoughts, I sat down behind the wheel of the car. But it didn't help. The grey ribbon of asphalt was flying under the wheels. We were rushing along the motorway Moscow, Minsk. I squeezed the throttle to the limit. The arrow of the speedometer was approaching the figure 80. The driver, Red Army soldier Natrasny, got worried. Hmm, comrade battalion commissar, you can't do that. Reduce the speed, the cut. I had to hand over the steering wheel to him, and I wanted to get to my brigade as soon as possible. I was drawn to the people.